Welcome everybody. Uh, this is not our normal classroom uh, because I felt like maybe today should reflect how it's feeling outside. So, you know, we're, we're trapped inside our, our nice little house, which if you ever look out the windows, I, I never even noticed that it was like beautiful fields outside the windows. I didn't even know the windows had an outside. So, I mean, you learn something new every day, you know? Um, yeah, he's, he's got a beautiful little field outside. It's nice. That's really nice. I never even bothered to look out the windows till uh, a friend of mine told me that there's actually a, a an outside to the house. Anywho, uh, today we're going to be covering the evolution of uh, arms and armor side by side with metallurgy. So metallurgy, for those of you who don't know, that's the, the study and perfection of smithing and metals, essentially. Uh, studying metals, uh, finding out their properties, learning how to combine them to make new metals, that, that kind of stuff. Very basically, when humanity first figured out that they could melt shit, like, like you know, with, with a fire, um, they started making, you know, weapons. Uh, some of the first weapons were made of copper and tin and brass, like this Byzantian mace here. Um, fun fact about this mace, it has a brass head to it. And for those of you who have ever played a musical instrument in band, that's brass. You know, most, most saxophones and trumpets are made of brass. And you're like, well, that shit's crazy fragile. I dropped my trumpet once and the whole thing just dented. Yeah. But when you make it into a solid ball, it's going to hit pretty hard. Now, as metals evolved, they moved away from brass to steel, which, you know, doesn't dent as easy. So most brass or bronze mace heads were smooth or, or spherical like this. They didn't have all these pokies because the pokies would bend or break too easy. When you got into tempered steel, you could make these pokies because now they're stronger. They're not going to bend and break on every hit. So it allowed weapons to get a lot more deadly. Um, it, th another sad thing about it is when you made bronze, bronze was poured into a mold. And then uh, that would give it its generic shape. And then you just had to kind of refine it, sharpen it up, take out the, the, the messy bits and, and sharpen it down to shape. Things like the Kopesh. This awesome design here. Now, I actually own... Uh, a training one of these, a polypropylene one of these, and they're phenomenal. This kind of shape was only doable because it was poured into a mold. Trying to hammer something into this shape was unknown to them at the time. Doable now, even with steel, but with the technology they had at the time, they could not make something like this out of iron or steel. It had to be bronze. Um, and as you can see, it is a, a wonderfully unique multi-tool of a weapon. Now, this would normally be dull right here, and that would be your blocking surface. Close to the hand, very solid part of the weapon that wouldn't, they, if it did pitch down, would get caught in this curve, allowing you to go over their weapon, come in with a stab or, or hook, slide around, come in with a slash. It, it was very form-functional, plus the forward pitch of this curve meant that chops hit like a battle axe, but still retained that slashing potential. Hook on the back for pulling weapons, pulling shields, or, or simply to give that tip a bit of a better spearhead on the thrust. Now, as they started to evolve and realized they couldn't be making weapons of this unique shape, they went on to iron. And out of iron, they made the... There it is. Nope, not you. There you are. A still similar idea with that with that forward pitch, kind of that it has here at the tip. But this one's a little more of an inverted curve. This is an iron weapon made by the Iberians. And due to it being made of, of solid iron, it was really easy just to hammer something like this out. Plus, iron is heavier than bronze, so that belly up here would have a lot more BAM to it. As they got into steel, they started going more towards weapons like this, the Xyphos. The Xyphos is amazing because it bells in and then back out, but with a solid spearhead, a very good cut and thrust kind of weapon. 
Now, the Romans had their own variant, but as you can see, both have that, that slight dip here in the middle. This one's a lot more pronounced, but this one still has it, even though it's a lot more square, right here at the tip, and then the little points. The, these kinds of weapons were fantastically made of iron and then later steel and used to so much good effect. Um, they're, they're, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it right now, everything on this table, a nasty bit of work. Um, these kinds of ones, as you can see, were more starting to get into the stab, while earlier weapons were more about that slash. But when we really want to talk about stab, we need to go no further than these two absolute ballers. So, the Dory and the Mycenaean Spear. So sharp that just the gentle push sinks them right through that wood. Oh my god, that is... I'm never going to get over how easily these things stab. That's that's a little too... Oh, there's my hand. A little too eerie. Um, so these weapons were made with... There we go. With the purpose of stabbing. And as you can see, the, the dory is a bit wider, with a bit more of that razor's tip as it goes in. While the bronze one, the, the Mycenaean Spear, the bronze one, is a solid diamond all the way around. Going down to a fine, fine point. A lot more of a steady taper than this guy. This guy's taper is a bit more extreme. I mean, look how, look how chunky that is. All right, what gives it its fine point is coming in on those swooping sides to give it that same razor's tip that the Mycenaean spear has. Um, when spears were made of bronze, you, you needed a good tip because most opponents you were going against had a bronze cuirass or were wearing a layered flax or linen. Um, other, other kinds of like wicker and whatnot armors that weren't really meant for stabbing, uh, they were meant to protect against... Just stay there. They were meant to protect against slashing weapons over stabbing weapons. So the spear became a quick favorite for its ability to punch right through those wicker armors, those, those flax armors and those other layered straw-like armors, while the bronze cuirass could stop it, yes. But a cuirass, much like this guy's barrel body, only covered that, meaning your head, your arms, and your legs were wide open, which allowed slashing weapons to get around it. So really, armor back then was less about what, you know, keeping you alive and more what you're going to be fighting against, because every armor back then had a weakness. Not to mention, bronze was not something you could kit a thousand soldiers in. Because it's difficult to make. Bronze is copper and tin melted together. So if you're giving everyone a freaking, you know, sword and a spear and a shield, chances are you're going to have to go a little light on the armor. Um, or if you're going heavy on the armor, you're going to have to go a bit light on the weaponry and not everyone's going to get every bit of, uh, every bit of steel. So uh, the, that's kind of just like... And then when the dory came out for the hoplites... This bit of metal, this iron or steel head, um, it, it's because bronze started to get way too expensive. It was way too hard to find. Iron was way easier to find. And when they started to refine iron to really kind of get working with it, they're like, why didn't we do this earlier? It's just as strong as bronze, but it's so much easier to work with. And that's a thing I hate about all fantasy games. They always make bronze worse. Not true. RuneScape is a massive culprit in this. Their bronze weaponry is always worse than even their crudest iron. Bronze can be as strong as steel if you make it right. If you add just a few more ingredients into the mix, you can make it as strong as steel, and it, unlike steel and iron, it does not rust. Good example, this Mycenaean sword. It is a gold-handled bronze sword. Now, this mix was not done perfectly. Um, as you can see, much like copper, like our, our good old Lady Liberty, the statue, um, it's starting to turn green. All right. Now, the Statue of Liberty is made of copper, so when she oxidized, she turned green. Now, bronze, in a perfect mix, cannot 
tarnish and oxidize. But the parts of the mix that are high in copper, if it's not, you know, perfect, like nest quick mix, um, as you can see, they will turn green. They'll they'll kind of tarnish a bit. But that's okay because like for for the length of time that it exists, we're finding a lot more bronze swords than we are iron because bronze lasts so much longer. Even even against steel, it just doesn't get eaten away like steel does. Um, if I had to make a weapon, I would make mine out of steel instead of that, just because I don't expect to live long enough to have a bronze weapon, you know, to, to make the rust an issue. But if I, if I were a medieval general outfitting my army, I guarantee you all my reserve soldiers are going to have bronze on them and not because they're reserves, but because they're probably not going to see battle as much. So they're not going to die as quick. So they need armor that's going to last as long as they will. Um, now, as armor or as weapons started to evolve and, and armor evolved with them, armor started out in in like wicker, leather, stuff like that, just padding like brigandines and gambesons and very basic armor that was meant to protect against slashing over anything else. Because most swords were meant to slash. So they built armor to protect against the slashing with occasional stab protection in there. Then plate started to become a lot more common. And chainmail, oh my god, was chainmail so common towards the, the great Viking migrations. Um, chainmail is a wonderful way to stop slashing weaponry. So the Vikings, knowing that they were going to be going up against others in chainmail, they invented an arrow type specifically meant to combat chainmail the bodkin arrow this little guy punches a hole right into the chain right right into the right into the center of that ring and just pops the ring open and, and gets you through it so when the Vikings realized that they were up against chainmail, they started inventing those those kinds of arrows. Now the Vikings eventually started fighting the Vikings as kind of you know wars of succession and shit were starting to rage, and they needed something to protect themselves from their own bodkin arrows or from bodkin arrows created by the Franks or the East Anglians or whoever else, and so they started putting metal discs over their chainmail, um, kind of like the gladiator's chest armor. Uh, here's an image. Thank you. Um, that kind of disc right there, the arrow would hit that disc and be unable to penetrate the disc. And the reason it would hit the disc is because the disc is center mass. And there's a great chance that they're going to be aiming at the center of your torso than anything else. So it hit that center and bounce. Or it hit that center and dent or get stopped or get caught in it and not go deep enough. Um, and then they're like, well, why just put a few discs on the armor? when we can just make the whole armor out of plates and put the chain mail under that. So then plate mail started to become far more common among people. Um, well, first, I guess it went, it, it went brigandines, which is a gambeson with like metal chunks put in it over the chain mail, but, or under the chain mail, maybe over the chain mail, but anywho, plate mail started to become a thing. And so weapons went more towards piercing than anything else because everyone was wearing chainmail, and that's why towards the Renaissance period, if you wanted to take somebody out, you had to use something like this. It was designed to poke through the gaps in chainmail, or through the, the bits where the plate mail didn't cover, like the armpits, the inner thighs, the edges of the neck, most of your side or back the this little guy was meant to just chunk right in through that shit really so yeah s stocks english tucks uh side swords all kinds of stuff like that got way more into the thrusting as you can see it's thick blade allowed it to penetrate armor that most swords could not but only allowed for shallow cuts because again this sword is not meant to slice a person. Um, these these swords here, as you can see, I'm kind of just going through them. These are like proto-rapiers. These small swords meant for dueling. Um, barely has an edge, but makes up for it on the thrust. As you can see, that is a very thick cross-section there. Meaning that, again, this sword was all about that pokey-pokey. Which, if you're fighting somebody, um, 
thrusts are actually way more devastating than than slashes. Because, like, let's say I've got my Gladius here. If I'm going to kill you with a slash, I've got to cut either enough of your torso to uh, cause you to bleed out, or I've got to chop deep enough into your body to hit something vital. So, you know, big, broad strike or real heavy chop. But with a thrust... There you go. Done. Simple as that. Just one poke. That's all it took. Boom. Right there. Right through the heart or through a lung. Through most of your, your chest cavity. You're, you're gonna have... Your, your lungs filling with blood now. You're gonna die. Or even if I don't stab you in the center of your chest... Boom. Through your small intestine. You've now got bits of half-digested food getting into your bloodstream. You're gonna get septicemia. You're gonna die. Thrusts are way deadly. And as armor got better and better against protecting against the cuts, which were more common on the battlefield than thrusts, um, they, because, you know, axes and stuff would chop down. A lot of swords were swung across the body um, because they wanted to get that chop in other than that thrust because the thrust's a bit harder to land sometimes. Um, they started building bigger and better armor, so weapons got more towards the thrusting. And then once thrusting weapons became, like, the main event, they just went right back to cuts. Like, armor became obsolete at that point. A um, good example of that... What the fuck was that? Oh. Um, great example of armor just suddenly being obsolete. The Golden Age of Sail, with guns and muskets. Um, for those of you who don't know, the word bulletproof came from when people would shoot plate mail with a freaking pistol, like a flintlock pistol, and then show the dent. This is the proof that it can stop a bullet. This is its bullet proof. And in Japan, bulletproof armor was sold a lot, but as guns got better and hit harder and got more powder, the armor had to get thicker and thicker and thicker until it was just too heavy to wear anymore. So once guns became a real common thing in warfare, armor was obsolete. So they went right back to wearing just coats, wearing gambesons, brigandines. And do you know what the funny thing is? Guess what weapons made a comeback the moment you're not wearing plate mail anymore? Come on, anybody. Anybody. Anybody before I get it? Nobody? Sabers! No stabby, all slicey came back. Do you want to know why? Because it's easier to chop somebody than to stab them. And so, as, as armor dwindled off and the golden age of sail started to rise, sailors needed a weapon that they could use to defend themselves on their boat. I like the naval one more. Where are you? Where's the naval one? Officer Saber? No. There it is. They needed a short sword that they could use on a boat to defend themselves against boarders or to chop through ropes or do whatever else they needed to do that wasn't going to get caught up. And the reason they didn't want a stabbing sword is because on a boat with it swaying back and forth and you're, oh, you're not going to be able to huh, as easily. You're going to whoosh, whoosh with the rock of the boat. And you're going to be chopping. So, because your opponent isn't wearing the thickest of armor, a slicing sword right across the chest, you know, ah, right across the, oh, Jesus, right across the chest, that's going to be deadly, you know, that, that's going to hurt. And because they're on a boat, they're, they're out in the middle of the sea, they're not going to be able to get the medical attention they need to save themselves from that cut. That, that's, you're done, right there. Big cut across the chest. It's going to get salt water in it, and you're, you're going to be trapped on this boat with a bunch of other stinking, unwashed men who haven't bathed in weeks. You haven't bathed in weeks. That The dirtiness of your shirt, any bacteria on that shirt, the sweat, the grime, all that, pushed into the cut that you just got. Now it's in your bloodstream. You're going to die. So what armor came about? For pirates. Well, they needed to be able to swim. Well, not just pirates, but the Navy. They needed to be able to swim. But they still needed something to protect them from swords and slashing and whatnot. So what they started doing was pieced plate mail. 
um, the the navy would wear would wear plates just where they needed it, which was typically a cuirass, uh, a a very angled chest piece that that came out to a point like that over the body. And the reason it angled like that was so when a bullet hit it, it would ping and glance. All right, they used angles instead of thickness. The armor wasn't actually all that thick. But due to the, the angle the armor was at, bullets would go, they'd hit it on that angle and get diverted just enough to glance and miss, or at least penetrate off to the side and not hit you center mass. And angled armor like that, you see it all too commonly on conquistadors and, and other bits of like the, the Spanish armadas that tried to conquer South America and the the North American uh, you know landers and it, basically anywhere that that the the great armadas landed they were wearing that kind of armor with their guns because that angle meant, meant that swords and spears would glance off bullets would glance off arrows would glance off and the armor didn't have to be super thick um the greatest example of where angling is used today is in tanks if you ever look at a modern tank yeah that that's that's all angles baby it's it's meant to bounce all kinds of shells so that way they don't hit you directly. They ricochet. Um, so then, you know, slicing weapons again became obsolete. Piercing weapons started to make a comeback, but because your opponents aren't wearing that same kind of armor, um, they started to go with like side swords or back swords, which were still single-sided swords, but they were meant more for, for deterring opponents. Now, even today on the high seas, the the pirates you're gonna meet are still wielding, you know, choppers. Uh, where's the Didao chopper? There, there's one used by Chinese pirates. It's the yeah, the Didao. These things are still super common among Chinese pirates and among pirates of like the, those other Asian waters. Because you can, it's large enough you can two-hand it for some real good swordplay, but it's still a chopper's weapon, you know? Bam, into the body. And they don't wear a lot of armor because they know that, you know, no matter how much armor they wear, it's not going to stop a freaking M16 or an AK-47. So, um, in, in the jungles, again, they can't wear heavy armor. It's too hot. So they they still use slicing weapons like machetes, like the Latin machete, a very common form of machete that we use all over the world now. Um, so armor had to evolve side by side with the weapons that were trying to bypass it, but at the same time, it was limited to how much armor you could put on by your environment. Um, a lot of people think the Vikings were these big, floof armor, and blah, they're big, and I'm impenetrable. I've got 30,000 bear furs on my back. No. What made Viking armor so damn impressive, and why the Vikings are today considered to be so freaking impressive. God, my nose itches so bad. Hmm. I got a, I got a floofy mustache right now, and it makes my nose itch. Um, the reason Vikings were so thick is because they wore bare fur over hauberks, which were like, instead of the tiny ringed chainmail, they were larger ringed chainmail. But it was still chainmail, and they'd wear plate. So they, they'd have these metal discs with the chainmail, with bear fur. And bears, as those of you know, like a grizzly bear, grizzly bears are practically bulletproof already. All right, you get yourself a grizzly bear hide that you've hardened through, you know, leather hardening, and you throw that on top of metal rings, on top of metal discs, on top of a gambeson, that you just need all of this just to stay warm in the winter months. Yeah, that guy's going to be immune to your sword and your axe and your bullshit. <laughs> he's going to be because of how many layers he's got on. Meanwhile, you go to like the Arabian deserts, you know, those kinds of guys were wearing silk because it, it drew heat out. They're wearing wicker armor, which is, you know, woven sticks, you know, wicker shield. Cause you know, they don't have a lot of wood. They don't have a lot of leather. So they're wearing mostly woven silk armor, not very heavy armor, but they've got giant wicker shields for the blocking and the whatnot. Not to mention they're using jareds, which are like shortened spears meant for throwing, and your your armor's not going to do a lot against that. Most 
Arabian countries used padded armor over anything else because they needed a way to get rid of the heat because they're going to die in the heat. So they would wear padded armor over metals, which would reflect light and trap heat into your body. Um, and yeah, I think that just about wraps up what I had planned for today, talking a bit about metallurgy, went a bit into how armors become appropriate throughout history. Um, yeah, that pretty much covers it. All right. Um, in the next episode, I'm doing a mod spotlight, just like when I did my shatter, uh, shatter blade one, I'm going to be spotlighting the Templar weapon pack. So I will see you guys there. We're going to be at a nice appropriate location, the Citadel. Bye everybody.